गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गनर शॉर्ट गनर शॉर्ट में आ... we're going to have a talk on china and taiwan and see what's next right and before i give a preamble to the whole story i'd like to welcome dr christina chen all the way from taiwan and christina welcome once again to gana shot and it's a pleasure hi. to have you on the channel hi hi good evening jenner shankar and um um i'm really happy to be back here and uh to um share uh, my two cents on um the the topic of um, today's show thank you yeah uh thanks a lot you we'll, i'm sure you'll give more than two cents uh, on the show at the outset i must thank you for making it possible that you could take time out because i know it's late in the day it's almost 10 o'clock there in uh, taiwan and in taipei and of course you have young children despite that you spoken you have come on the channel and i'm grateful to you i'd like to tell everyone who's watching this uh, you know broadcast uh, dr christina chen is this is the third time for her on gana shot and she's given sound bites otherwise also during the election so and more important than that she is a brilliant uh, you know uh, individual and she is in one of the leading think tanks of uh, taiwan indus here i've written for on that uh, you know for the think tank once or twice and i'm very glad that she's been able to come here uh, she is very well educated she's done her phd in san diego university of california san diego and i think whenever i've spoken to her i've got the feeling that there is someone who actually knows what she is talking about and her specialty is china and politics in china and we couldn't have had someone better than her to talk about uh, what's next in between china and taiwan so the backdrop uh, early this year the elections were held in taiwan and as you, you would all know or you would have probably forgotten dr william lai chingte you know he has been elected as uh, to be the next president of uh, taiwan and his installation or rather his coming into office is going to take place on 20th of may in this period of time china has done a lot of uh, nonsense they interfered in the elections without any reservation to get their candidate in but they failed in fact i always say who won the elections in taiwan the presidential election it was dr william lai chingte who lost the elections it was china right it was not dpp it was not uh, D, uh, dpp or rather not kmt it was china who lost the elections yeah and this loss has not gone down well in china and after that they have been very coercive on taiwan right and a uh, lot of air violations lot of naval exercises around and this have happened as late as last week right and with a new president and chair china will just up the ante because they consider dr william lai chingte as a separatist just because he doesn't to the communist line is a uh, out and out democrat who feels that taiwan should chart its own course right and that's what we are also doing I mean, we all understand this at this point of time because we are going through our elections and today we had our fourth round of elections right now it is in this context i thought we should see what's next in the taiwan china relationship oh uh, so with this as a background I'll hand you over to uh, Dr. Christina Chen, who's going to take us through. She's got a set of nice slides, and um, over to you, Dr. Christina. Whenever you want the slide, it will be up. All yours. Great. Uh, thank you, General Shankar, for the introduction um, of uh, myself. 
and I'm very thankful for that you um so, by the way this is my cat <laughs> she will be oh, good. <laughs> she'll That's come okay. in and out <laughs> i'll try to i'll try to put her down but like it, it, you know if she comes in and out to the <laughs> don't mind her um so um thank you for um for the introduction and i'm very happy and grateful um once again for um for the introduction and also thank you for um the backdrop to uh today's um um presentation and um, as uh, General Shankar, you, um, you know, pointed out that, um, you know, I think uh, uh, this year, 2024, is a year that's um, pretty important uh, and um, maybe not turbulent, but, you know, it's quite important for um, the global environment. And this is because uh, you talked about um, Taiwan um, just well, not just, but, no, but early this year, Taiwan had um, the uh, election, uh, not just the presidential, but also the legislative elections combined. And um, in fact, I think um, the overall picture is that this year is the so-called super uh, election year um, because uh, not just Taiwan, but I think what the entire world is uh, watching very um, closely is the upcoming U.S. election. So to, uh, this year is pretty um, major, you know, in terms of uh, the um, the results of those uh, major elections of, uh, worldwide will definitely have a significant impact on geopolitics. So um, back to um, Taiwan and the cross strait situation, uh, definitely, I mean, um, after uh, the elections were held and um, the results uh, will, um, will definitely have an impact on how um, um, China uh, deals with Taiwan and um, also um, Taiwan's um, situation. So um, I'd like to begin by, um, so uh, Jenna Shankar, could you uh, post a slide yeah. now, please? Thank you. So yes, what's next uh, is uh, what many analysts and people China watchers, um, cross strait um, observers are interested in knowing. Um, so um, I would like to start off by uh, talking a little about uh, the strategic environment that China is facing. Um, next, please. Because I mean, um, this strategic environment would, would shape how China views uh, itself vis-a-vis -vis the world. And also um, it will shape how China um tries to um to work you know with taiwan or tries to how how it deals with taiwan um for the near term so uh, to begin with um i think it is uh very uh safe and many people would agree with me that um china is actually facing a a challenging strategic environment uh, because if we look at um the um internal um domestic uh, environment of China. Um, there's a lot of troubles, uh, a lot of challenges um, in Xi Jinping's hands. Uh, well, um, I think when uh, last time I remember uh, talking about um, in, in General Shengar's show about China's uh, economy. And uh, last time I talked about Chinese economy, um, my view is that it's um, stagnating. Um, some people might disagree with my view. Um, they might think that it's not towards stagnation. It's just having a slowdown. I think either way, it shows that China is not doing well, you know, in terms of its domestic economy. And um, this year, uh, my view is still the same. I think uh, even though the latest figures, the latest data show that, you know, there's slight improvement um, in indicators such as you know, trade. So I think uh, the exports, the latest figure of Chinese export um, show that it match their forecast. And the imports actually exceeds a little of, um, above the forecast. Still, um, I think analysts uh, believe that despite these signs of improvements, um, the, the growth or the improvement will be a very, very weak one. And this is because um, the structure um, hasn't really changed. And um, if you look at, you know, for example, um, the real estate sector, 
you see that um, the real estate sector hasn't really shown much of improvement, even though the um, CCP from the top till the, you know, um, the city uh, level, uh, they have tried to come up with a lot of policy measures to boost, you know, in their attempt to boost uh, consumer uh, confidence in the real estate market. So they try to come up with a lot of policies, but um, hasn't really shown uh, signs of uh, improvement in the real estate sector. And given that the real estate sector is really the engine of um, Chinese private sector growth and the Chinese economy in general, if the real estate um, is not improving, um, then um, it is very difficult for the entire economy to show a rebound. So that's real estate. Uh, we also see you know, uh, things like um, unemployment, uh, youth unemployment uh, remains a very serious problem, even though nowadays um, fewer people pay attention to this issue. And I think this is because uh, last year, um, the uh, CCP, the Chinese government, they, uh, you know, for a, a while, they stopped releasing the uh, data. And then when they reintroduce the unemployment data, they've changed the indicator. You know, they changed the way the, the um, data w was calculated uh, in an attempt to kind of um, hide the truth, to, to show a, a a better picture. So um, I think um, people stop uh, talking a lot about unemployment among the young people, but I think that problem still remains. And um, also uh, when it comes to another economic indicator, I mean, local governments, they're still um, experiencing a lot of uh, financial troubles. A lot of the local governments, uh, they uh, have debt overhang and uh, haven't really, um, have a chance to um, get rid of their debt. So uh, that's also very uh, serious. And last but not least, I mean, uh, China um, is uh, facing this deflationary pressure. So all in all, I think um, the economy is not showing signs of improvement. And this year, I mean, during the two sessions, uh, the uh, Chinese government uh, came up with a, again, a modest expectation, you know, of five, 5% GDP growth target. It's the same as last year's growth target. Um, so um, it's not a, a very ambitious one. And also it shows that the um, Chinese government and the CCP, they, are, um, um, they also have this view that uh, the economy is not going to do you know, well in the near future. So faltering economy you know, is a major, major challenge because if the economy sucks, you know, that's going to have lead to a series of social economic problems um, and also subsequent challenges. Um, so uh, when it comes to economy, some people were expecting uh, Xi Jinping and the CCP to uh, come up with uh, a policy, a series of policy terms. So they were um, thinking that, well, Xi Jinping and the CCP may have realized that what they have been doing is not really good for the economy. So um, the expectation was that there may be some U-turn back to the uh, more reform and opening um, period um, economic measures. However, I mean, I just mentioned the two sessions. Um, in the two sessions, um, the according to the government report made at two sessions, um, the CCP is still insisting on the overall trajectory of its economic policy. In other words, uh, it's still maintaining a very heavy regulatory control on the private sector. Um, it's not loosening um, the control on the private sector. And um, it hasn't really um, shown a desire to introduce a stimulus package, something that many economists believe will help boost um, uh, Chinese economy. So no stimulus packages seeing and a continuation of a strict control over China's uh, private sector. So you know, government showed no intention to promote short-term growth. Some um, analysts uh, even think that you know, that is the precise intention of Xi Jinping. I mean, he, he thinks that you know, there's no need to introduce any measures to boost the economy and um, 
maybe he's thinking about a long term, you know. But uh, when it comes to the economy, I think the um, indication is that um, no desire from the government part to boost uh, the economy in the short term. Sorry, <laughs> I, no. it's very, um, no, in turn, my, my cat is, um, you know, she's, she's going to be here mm -hmm. in and out <laughs> sometimes. So, <laughs> please bear with us. Um, so yeah. um, I think um, uh, you all know that um, it's not just about the economic challenges and social uh, challenges, but uh, Xi Jinping definitely uh, show uh, some lack of confidence, if not insecurity. Uh, uh, in the political realm. So last year, um, we saw, uh, you know, top uh, political figures uh, like Qin Gang and Li Shangfu, you know, they, they were disappeared, you know, and out of blue. And then um, they were officially purged uh, after a while of uh, being disappeared. And also, I mean, the rocket force, which was considered the elite uh, uh, military force, um, in the PLA, and one that is uh, crucial for uh, Taiwan, you know, um, if um, uh, PLA were to invade Taiwan, the rocket force was considered uh, inst instrumental in that. Uh, a lot of the elites from the rocket force were purged. So I think uh, that shows uh, this lack of confidence uh, from Xi, Jin Xi Jinping's part. So all in all, I, what I'm saying is that internal-wise, Xi Jinping and the CCP are facing um, challenges, something that they need to focus and try to uh, resolve um, because these are very serious challenges. And um, external wise, um, the uh, uh, Chinese are also facing a very tough environment. When it comes to the structural, structure, you know, um, the US-China relations, even though uh, Xi Jinping and Biden have met um, end of last year during APEC, and you know after that we uh, saw you know those top officials from both sides having more and more meetings and more talks and more exchanges. Um, still, I think the overall structure of um, U.S.-China relations remain um, competitive. So there's um, competition. And um, let's say, you know, take the uh, technology as an example. Um, the United States uh, hasn't really um, loosened um, its export controls on semiconductor. You know, so semiconductor, they're uh, continuing um, coming up with export controls to prevent Chinese access to chips. And used to be, you know, um, there's more restrictions on Chinese access to advanced chips. Now, uh, the Biden administration is considering um, expanding the export controls to mature legacy chips. So that really shows um, a, a active effort from the U.S. government side to prevent Chinese from developing the semiconductor and critical technologies because semiconductors are very important for the development of critical technologies such as AI, quantum and etc. So um, we, we see on the technology side, this intent, uh, continuation of intent from the US to restrict Chinese um, development. And also um, the latest um, talks are uh, no longer about semiconductor, but about uh, another set of products, you know, electric vehicles, solar panels, um, batteries. So these um, are also being talked by uh, the U.S. and also EU. So uh, EU and U.S. Um, they are complaining, you know, about and, and complaining um, in open about Chinese uh, having, you know, um, ma making this overcapacity, uh, creating too many um, electric vehicles, and because you know the government is subsidizing those um, industries. Uh, with um, heavily, so so um, the the trade uh, of electric vehicles and um, solar panels and so forth, these have become the key issue and the key point of contention between the U.S. and China, and also uh, between EU and um, China. Not to mention, also, I mean, um, from the EU side and also from the U.S. side. I mean, Blinken um, 
just um, you know, visited uh, Beijing when he was there. I think his main intention um, was to try to tell China stop supporting Russia because uh, the U.S. government has found evidence uh, that uh, Chinese are supporting the Russians' uh, defense um, um, industry you know, to um, help Russia to expand the defense industry to the point that that could give them advantage on the battlefield. So, um, I mean, Ukraine and uh, trade, uh, these have become the key, the centers for contention between uh, the U.S. and China, also between the EU and China. So um, these pressures uh, will not likely to um, to go down in the near future. So China is facing a pretty tough external environment. Um, but um, you know, when it comes to Taiwan, I think, uh, yes, um, we should see uh, the Taiwan's electoral outcome as a uh, victory for the Taiwanese population, uh, the people in Taiwan, uh, despite uh, facing a lot of pressures from China, they um, still you know, uh, voted uh, the people uh, they want to support. So um, I think the results definitely show that the Taiwanese public uh, was intimidated. Uh, so um, uh, PRC's attempts to intimidate, to uh, sh um, um, influence the electoral outcomes has failed. However, I think um, the electoral outcome also gave um, CCP some hope because even though the presidential, um, on the presidential side, uh, DPP uh, won. So uh, um, uh, Lai Qingde is going to be the, uh, the president uh, for the next term. Yes, but when it comes to the legislative yuan, um, the outcome shows a three-way race. So DPP no longer is the majority uh, in the legislative yuan. It has to share uh, power with the KNT and also the third party called TPP. So um, given that, I think that um, gave uh, China a sense of hope uh, that it could um, infiltrate or try to co-opt uh, the uh, opposition's uh, parties, uh, opposition to the DPP. Uh, so I think all in all, implication um, given the strategic environment that China is facing is that uh, when it comes to the possibility of um, invasion, I think the invasion um, scenario is less likely to happen in the near future. However, we still uh, need to bear in mind that um, China um, will continue to ramp up its pressure on Taiwan. So um, we need to be uh, very go to watch out for uh, these pressures uh, because these pressures uh, could um, escalate and could lead to um, some kind of conflict, even though the CCP so far um, does not have the intention to invade Taiwan or to conduct a large scale conflict across the strait. Next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, um, given um, China's strategic environment, I think um, I would like to spend some time to talk about China's policies towards Taiwan. So um, I talked about the uh, two sessions, um, which happened uh, March this year. During the two sessions, um, if we look at uh, the content of the two sessions, um, the part regarding Taiwan shows nothing unusual. In the sense that, I mean, um, we don't really see much um, attention um, or content being devoted to the discussion on Taiwan uh, during the MPC uh, session or the CPC uh, PP sessions. So um, not much um, talk on Taiwan. And also um, during the two sessions, there's really no um, major policy being introduced on Taiwan. So nothing like you know anti-succession law, which you know was really big. And um, if you look at the government reports or uh, relevant reports uh, from the two sessions, uh, the discussions on Taiwan show no new terms being introduced. So no new policy on Taiwan, 
And when it comes to the descriptions or discussion on Taiwan, um, the terms that were used are kind of the same, you know, pretty consistent. So um, nothing new about Taiwan. Um, that is what I'm trying to say. And, um, and some um, uh, media reports uh, have caught uh, this uh unusual thing which is that uh during the uh the mpc session when uh li chang premier li chang made uh the government report uh when he was talking about taiwan the term peaceful was uh not there it was absent not there, yeah. the yeah the government report so uh some um media analyst or analysts or um uh, media uh reports said well does that mean uh, if there's a mission of the term peaceful, does that mean uh, CCP is going to launch a war or is uh, very likely to do such a thing um, um, uh, against Taiwan? I think the CCP um, has thought about that too. Because, I mean, uh, during the two sessions, I mean, so Li Chang made the uh, governance work report. And um, later, um, um, during um, an, uh, two other occasions, Xi Jinping, um, if, when he delivered uh, uh, some remarks at one of the meetings in the two sessions, and also Wang Huning, uh, who is in charge of the Taiwan Affairs, uh, he, at another meeting uh, during the two sessions, I mean, they both uh, talked about Taiwan and the term peaceful was reinserted. So it was brought back to their discussion um, on Taiwan. So I think that showed um, the elites, uh, the CCP elites, um, realized that they have made this omission um, in the uh, government's work report, and that might, you know, um, you know, show some signal uh, that they didn't want to show. So that is why uh, Xi Jinping and Wang Huning, uh, they kind of put the term peaceful back into their talk, their remarks on Taiwan. So um, so that's one thing. And um, when it comes to um, China's policy on Taiwan, I think um, another uh, indicator to look at is not, on, uh, not based on the uh, two sessions, but a, um, uh, the Central Conference on Taiwan work which took place a month before the two sessions. So during uh, the Central Conference on Taiwan work, uh, Wang Huning, he talked about, you know, um, the term attack Taiwan independence. So, you know, um, this, uh, there's a shift, the transition from oppose Taiwan independence to attack Taiwan independence. But I want to say that even though the term has shifted to attack, which seem um, like you know a signal for invasion or for a large scale conflict, I think um, it's not necessarily um, that, but it's more, I think, a more indication of the CCP uh, being going to be more proactive. They're going to be more proactive and they are going to put more effort and more vigor in implementing their China, uh, their Taiwan policy. So my assessment is that based on China's strategic, the environment that China is facing, it has less intention to um, to launch invasion. I mean, it's not ready. You know, it's preoccupied with uh, with a lot of challenges. Um, but um, and also, I mean, the electoral outcomes in Taiwan has given hope. So. Um, what I'm saying is that I think um, from now on, you know, for the near term, um, Ch China is going to uh, uh, maintain this peaceful reunification as a possible goal. So it has not given up that option yet. And it's going to adopt or continue the so-called two-prong strategy using both sticks and carrots. Um, for Taiwan to to um, to try to influence Taiwan and to um, you know to uh, try to get um, its goals. Um, so that term attack Taiwan independence, I think, refers to this um, more active implementation, um, more um, forceful implementation of the Taiwan policy. You know, whether it be using um, carrots to co-opt Taiwan or to use sticks to intimidate Taiwan, I think 
um, either way, the CCP, um, they are going to try to be more proactive and more aggressive uh, in um, implementing, implementing their, um, their strategies against Taiwan. So um, again, likelihood of large scale conflict, I think is uh, pretty low in the near future, but we will see um, the uh, intensification of hybrid warfare, okay, and um, coercion against Taiwan. So these course of tactics will increase and they will intensify um, given, you know, uh, the CCP has indicated that it's going to be more proactive in um, trying to influence Taiwan to, um, um, you know, um, to try to, um, I guess, put more pressure on the upcoming Lai administration. Next, please. Thank you. So, um, like I said, I think um, my view is that um, um, from now on, on uh, for the near term, um, the CCP will continue its two-pronged strategy towards Taiwan. Because as I said, uh, peaceful reunification remains a option for uh, Xi Jinping and the CCP. Um, however, um, there's going to be a combination of carrots and sticks. So when it, com when it comes to the carrots uh, tactics, uh, we saw that um, after the uh, Taiwan's elections, uh, we see more and more interactions, more and more exchanges between uh, China and the uh, oppositions, namely the KMT. So uh, take um, you know, um, last month, uh, Ma Ying-jeou, who was the former president of Taiwan, he made his second visit to Beijing. So he has visited Xi Jinping um, before, and this is the second time that uh, Ma Ying-jeou uh, visited China and had a meeting with Xi Jinping. And when he was um, in Beijing, um, I think media said, uh, media uh, reports indicated that uh, Ma Ying-jeou uh, received um, you know, a very, very good treatment, uh, very high profile um, treatments. And given that you know, he's no longer the current uh, politician, active politician in Taiwan, being a former uh, politician, the, the treatments that he received was pretty um, uh, good. So I think um, that's one indication that um, you know the CCP is trying to send you know to maybe the international community in Taiwan that see like I'm um, you know being really nice to a, a a politician from Taiwan, a political figure from Taiwan, and during the meeting. Uh, Xi Jinping and Ma Ying-jeou's meeting, uh, Xi Jinping sent the uh, central messages, which is that both Taiwan and China belong to the Chinese nation and also key to peaceful development of cross-strait relations lies in the support of the 92 consensus. I mean, these are not news. They're, they're, they've been um, there, you know, um, um, in the Chinese rhetoric when it comes to Taiwan. So it's nothing new, but I think it's worthwhile to mention that given the situation, the context that uh, Ma ying -jeou went to, um, to China to have this meeting with Xi Jinping, um, Xi Jinping um, reiterated these. So um, it's indication that uh, first Xi Jinping um, regarded this meeting with Ma uh, very, very uh, seriously, and also show you know the 92 consensus that was uh, brought up again, and 92 consensus. I think um, it's a, a uh, not a policy, but um, it's uh, formulated uh, in 1992 uh, when um, KMT was uh, the ruling uh, party at the time. So representatives from KMT met with uh, CCP. And um, they, during the meeting, they uh, came to the agreement that you know they will uphold uh, the uh, idea that there's only one China. However, the tricky part of 92 consensus is that you know yes, one China, but each can interpret it, uh, China uh, on its own. So for Taiwan, um, China uh, means Republic Republic of China. 
and for uh, uh, the uh, CCP, uh, China means PRC. However, I think what has changed is that, uh, especially after Xi Jinping came to office, for the Chinese, the 92 consensus is less and less about one China, two interpretation, you know, interpretation um, in, a, in its own. For the Chinese, I think it's becoming clear that they think one China is just about PRC. So that room for inter interpretation is uh, gone you know, from uh, for the Chinese side. So when Xi Jinping, during this meeting with Ma Yingzhou, he uh, talked, reiterated this 92 consensus, um, I think it's um, different. You know, we need to uh, 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 realize that this 92 consensus for uh, CCP means you know, um, China in, um, as PRC. So it's no longer about, yeah, you can you know, walk away and you know, interpret the, uh, uh, China um, as either PRC or ROC. Uh, 92 consensus is about one China principle and it's about PRC only. So that's something that I think we need to uh, differentiate, you know. So when it was back back in the old day, yes, it's um, if interpretation, you know, um, freely to interpret uh, the term one China. But nowadays, when China uh, proposes 92 consensus, it's no longer about that. There's really no room for interpretation. So that's why I think it's significant to to kind of uh, to to point this out, and also um, I think following right after uh, Ma Yingzhou uh, visited uh, China, um, the uh, there's 17 um, members from the legislative yuan, and they're all from KMT. They also visited China and um, um, as a delegation. And um, they expected that you know the after the uh, the visit, uh, the uh, the Chinese will um, uh, return the favor by uh, lifting bans on tourist and agricultural products. So there are talks about you know um, the KMT visited and uh, the will lead to some positive outcomes and a return of favor from the Chinese side. So um, I think the KMT kind of also boasted that. Uh, however, um, you know, so far I haven't really seen that happening. Okay, next, please. So, um, well, um, I've talked about two examples where um, after uh, Taiwan's elections, uh, the CCP are um, intensifying its exchanges and um, meetings with uh, representatives from Taiwan, but these are all from the KMT. So uh, no one from DPP um, um, had um, um, this kind of exchange or talks with uh, the CCP. So uh, I think that's an uh, indication that so far, you know, CCP um, did, does not want to talk you know, uh, to to DPP. Even though you know, uh, Lai Qingde, uh, when um, he was making the speech, uh, uh, when when he um, during um, the victory, you know, uh, the speech, I think Lai Qingde made it really clear that um, the upcoming government has the desire uh, to have a dialogue with the uh, with the Chinese. But I think uh, the Chinese. Um, it has no incentives uh, to talk to the DPP because I mean they 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 can talk to the oppositions. Um, so I think um, the soft approach from the CCP uh, towards Taiwan has uh, the intention to you know to quote from um, Sun Tzu uh, to subdue the enemy without fighting. So trying to use the carrots so selectively uh, in the hope that they do not need to uh, reunify Taiwan. Um, using force. And I think um, the intention is also that and they're trying to show uh, the to the United States and maybe to the international community that, hey, look, you know, um, I, I, you know, Xi Jinping and uh, the CCP, we have the intention to de-escalate the conflict. You know, we, we are not 
trying to uh, to create war across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we are talking, we are having dialogues with um, Taiwan, but you know, uh, um, what they did not say is that it's you know just the KMT uh, politicians. Uh, they are not um, talking, and I don't think they will uh, talk to the DPP government. Um, under Lai ching -te. So uh, the one intention for them is to, to kind of show this willingness to de-escalate uh, conflict. And I also uh, think that, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, the message uh, or the effects that they're trying to create uh, to Taiwan is to exert more pressure on the incoming DPP government, uh, the Lai ching administration, because, you know, say, you know, I think they are uh, trying to create this impression that, again, uh, China is willing to to have a dialogue with Taiwan. And um, they are you know, doing this and they will uh, continue to do it. Uh, they're showing their goodwill uh, to uh, the Taiwanese people. Um, but um, again, you know, the, the, the thing is that they are being selective, you know, they are willing to talk to the KMT, but not necessarily the DPP. And also, I think uh, by, uh, you know, talking about uh, 92 consensus and making the 92 consensus as the precondition to dialogues with Taiwan. So KMT uh, can talk and visit Beijing and have talks with Xi Jinping and uh, the CCP because they uphold the 92 consensus. Uh, DPP hasn't done that yet. So I think uh, China is also sending a signal to Taiwan that, you know, look, you know, if I can talk with you, but you have to accept the 92 consensus. As, and as I pointed out, the 92 consensus now, the nature of the 92 consensus has uh, sh has changed. It's no longer about one China, different interpretation. It's really just about China, one China, and that is PRC. It's not about ROC and anything else. So for DPP, it is very difficult to accept the 92 consensus as a precondition to having a dialogue with China. Um, so that's why I think um, um, the effect is reduce Taiwan, especially the uh, Taiwan government's space of maneuver. Because um, you know, if they want to have a dialogue to uh, peaceful, try to peacefully resolve the situation, they have to accept this precondition. And I don't think the DPP government is going to do that. So uh, that's the second uh, uh, impact they, that they're trying to create. The third impact they're trying to create uh, by using this carrot approach is uh, to divide the Taiwan's public. You know, they're trying to kind of uh, 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 drive a wedge to uh, to Taiwan's public, and you know, trying to show the Taiwanese pub public that see, we have the goodwill. We are interested in talking and having dialogues. We may even um, lift you know, bans on your agricultural products. We may even lift bans on tourists. We uh, will try to reintroduce these uh, favors and these economic benefits if you accept uh, the 192 consensus. So I think uh, the third possible impact or the possible intention is to divide the Taiwanese public. Whether they are going to work, uh, I think is a different question, but um, that's their intention. So. Um, well, coming back to uh, their efforts uh, of co-opting the KMT politician, I think so far it's showing some kind of impacts, some kind of effects, because um, um, lately, uh, Ma ying uh, has been uh, talking with uh, the chairman of KMT, uh, Zhu Lilun, Eric Chu. So they've been talking and they are uh, discussing about uh, the KMT legislators trying to amend the existing Anti-Infiltration Act of 2020. So the Anti-Infiltration Act was passed um, at, in attempt to counter uh, Chinese interference in Taiwan's political system. So uh, one key uh, measure about the Anti-Infiltration Act is to um, prevent uh, or to have a, a strict regulation on 
uh, political donations, campaign funds, and so forth, because there are evidence showing that um, the CCP are um, funneling funds, uh, political uh, uh, supports, campaign funds to some politicians in Taiwan to help them win uh, elections and have you know, um, um, exert influence on Taiwanese politics. So um, you know, KMT is talking about amending or loosening uh, the regulations uh, per the Anti-Infiltration Act. So if they succeed in amending this Anti-Infiltration Act, then uh, the effort to counter Chinese interference in Taiwan's political system may be weakened. So I think this shows that the KMT is responding to um, the, the carrots, right? They are um, um, reciprocating um, um, in a sense. So, um, so uh, my worry is that uh, this tactic uh, may, show, may be showing some um, effects uh, for the CCP. Yeah. Next slide, please. So um, I talked about the carrots uh, tactics, um, but um, um, it is very clear that uh, uh, China is also uh, using the sticks. Uh, so it's not just about you know giving the carrots and favors. It's also about ramping up pressure on Taiwan um, to especially on the upcoming uh, DPP government. So I, I mentioned about, you know, this intensification of hyper warfare against Taiwan. Um, we are seeing signs that uh, the PLA um, and China in general are using this against Taiwan. Um, in uh, mid-February, a uh, an incident happened uh, near Kinmen. So um, the incident is that uh, a, a, I think it's a fishing boat, a Chinese fishing boat, um, entered uh, uh, the Kinmen water. So it's an illegal entry into the Kinmen water. Maybe it's by accident, I don't know. But what happened was that um, the, the ship uh, was being chased by the Taiwanese Coast Guards. And uh, uh, the, the ship capsized as a result. And because of that, um, two fishermen were, uh, they, they, they died from the incident, from the chase. And um, immediately, uh, the uh, CCP did not really have a, a, a high profile response immediately after the incident. However, a few days later, what happened was that uh, in the water near Kimen and Mazu, uh, Chinese Coast Guard show up okay, in the water, uh, which belonged to Taiwan. And they were ev they even um, went on board of a uh, Taiwanese uh, ship that's uh, boarded by tourists. So so it's not you know fisherman uh, ship. It's you know a ship full of Taiwanese uh, tourists. Uh, but uh, the the Ta uh, Chinese Coast Guard was there, and they um, went on board to um, to inspect. Yeah. So. Um, so this is um, considered you know, hyper warfare or gray zone tactic. The incident itself might not be intentional. Now, I, I, we're not saying uh, the Chinese intentionally you know, made the accident happen. I think it's, it's more like an accident. However, uh, the response made by uh, China uh, showed that it's using this um, accident uh, intentionally to you know, to expand its influence uh, onto the Taiwanese water. Um, so it's considered a gray zone tactic. And um, also um, uh, last month, um, uh, two events happened. One is that uh, China um, all of a sudden just announced a unilateral opening of uh, this uh, air route M503 and another connecting flight route near the Taiwan airspace. So that is a very obvious encroachment on Taiwan's airspace. And also, you know, that's very clear um, sign of gray zone tactic, trying to squeeze Taiwan's buffer zone to uh, reduce Taiwan's situation awareness, uh, the response time. So a very clear attempt to use gray zone tactic uh, against Taiwan to increase pressure um, Taiwan's government, um, especially incoming um, Lai Ching administration. 
And also um, on the economic side, you know, we've seen uh, China using um, you know trade as a way to uh, coerce Taiwan. You know, they they come up with a series of agricultural product bans, you know, on Taiwan. But um, last month, what happened was um, uh, China all of a sudden uh, the Ministry of Commerce in China announce a punitive tariff um, against Taiwan's um, polycarbonate exports. You know, the polycarbonate exports product uh, to uh, China has been put on this, um, I think it's more than 20% of tariff. And uh, China accused Taiwan of uh, dumping uh, the polycarbonate um, products to China. So that's why they said, you know, they, they will increase the tariff to more than 20%. And the polycarbonate um, uh, products are widely used. You know, they're used on um, electronic appliances, on optic products, uh, medical devices, um, even cars. So um, given the wide nature of its usage, its application, so this is something that you know, can create a serious consequence on Taiwan's polycarbonate trade. So I think um, the timing of these two issues, I mean, they both happened uh, in April and kind of back to back. Uh, so the incidents, the timing of the incidents definitely suggests there's a political, uh, it's a political maneuvering on um, China's side. You know, they're using the, the economic coercion and uh, military coercion as a way to pressure, increase their pressure on, on Taiwan, and especially try to coerce, uh, to ramp up their pressure on Lai Qingde's administration. Um, next, please. All right, so uh, I think I'm on my last uh, slide. So uh, implication for Taiwan-China relations, um, as I said, I think in, um, in the near future, uh, it is unlikely for large-scale conflict across the strait to happen. However, um, the um, examples that I showed uh, suggest that um, the uh, Chinese will continue to use both carrots and sticks against Taiwan. Um, on the carrot side, we uh, probably will see more efforts from um, China to um, to have dialogues or have meetings with uh, the opposition um, politicians, not the DPP, but you know, KMT most likely, maybe the TPP politicians. And um, that's one, one side. But on the stick uh, side, uh, definitely more pressure, more coercive tactics um, military tactics, economic tactics, and some people even talk about, you know, legal warfare um, as the next weapon used by uh, China against Taiwan. So more attempts by China to make Taiwan a domestic rather than international issue and to reduce international communities' help. That is their goal, you know, to reduce international communities' help and to alienate Taiwan. Um, so um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I Thanks a lot. I think you covered the whole gamut of uh, the equation which is existing between China and Taiwan and what's going to come ahead. Uh, uh, let me ask you a few questions. Sure. You know, the last slide which you said, China's attempt will uh, be to make dom uh, China, Taiwan a domestic issue and ensure that it doesn't become an international issue. So in this regard, what can India do to help Taiwan? So I think um, um, my answer is that um, um, I think um, my understanding is that uh, border disputes um, is uh, something that um, um, also um, India is also concerned about it. Um, so um, I think one possibility is that um, India, I think it's just to, to um, try to voice uh, its concern about this and to um, um, kind of highlight India's experience um, in this matter, you know, uh, border dispute, this long-term border dispute with uh, between India and um, China um, and how China is uh, using a variety of ways to coerce um, India uh, to uh, to try to to um, 
to to do this. Um, so um, I think one um, possibility, as I said, is to draw com uh, no, comparison to to make this parallel uh, more obvious. So that um, one thing is that uh, maybe that would help um, um, people in India to become more aware of um, the situation that's happening in Taiwan. Um, I think um, people in India um, have already, uh, you know, um, increased their awareness uh, given what's happening recently. So um, what I'm saying is that uh, I think the more the better. So uh, this uh, parallels uh, drawn between India and Taiwan um, to show that, you know, we are on the same boat, that we are um, all, uh, both facing um, increasing pressures from China. And this pressure is um, military, yes, but um, it also comes in different forms. So um, I think uh, that's one 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 way uh, to kind of uh, draw the comparison to highlight the the similar experiences that both India and Taiwan face, and uh, so we have a common target uh, to to deal with or to try to come up with a response to. Yeah, I think uh, in my own opinion. Uh, there's a lot of room for India and Taiwan to cooperate. Maybe INDCR uh -huh. can consider this. Yes. Uh, as to how to fight the Chinese narratives and how to build a counter narrative against China's coercive tactics. Right. Right. And especially in view of the fact that, you know, if you remember some time back, they came out with a new standard map with a new, with a, from the nine dash line, it's now become a ten dash line, and a large yeah. part of India they have shown this thing. Maybe there is it's time for us to start talking on this, and you know, convert it from just talk into some kind of a legal warfare uh, option, mm. right? Maybe we could talk about this when we have our discussion. And for everyone, I would like to tell everyone, and I've just proposed to Dr. Chen that. You know, between their think tank, INDCR, and our think tank, which is CASA and CLAUS, right? We will have a, a, a you know, panel discussion and what, how maybe, I mean, the topic, I'd leave it to, uh, you know, INDCR, what you, you want. But my thing is how more cooperation between India and uh, Taiwan. That's what my trust line would be. Okay. Uh, the second thing which I want to ask you and uh, is this. You know, they're taking out a lot of military action, which is coercive in nature. Is it visible to the common uh, people in Taiwan? Do they feel it? Or is it something which is just reported in the media? And, you know, it's one thing for people like you and me who are aware of it to you know react and analyze and all that. But what is the effect on the common people? Because it's ultimately the people of Taiwan who will decide what to do regarding going one way or the other with China. Um, okay, about that one, I, I think uh, people um, are aware. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, looking back to history, I think um, um, for uh, people in Taiwan, uh, we are really used to the the uh, course of tactics, the military intimidation from Taiwan. I mean, uh, as early as um, 90, in the 90s, um, yeah. They done the, the the drills, you know, fire the the the, the missiles across Taiwan. Um, but I, I think uh, back then, uh, Taiwanese people, um, more Taiwanese people were um, worried. Uh, but um, again, the the outcomes of the election uh, show that you know um, Taiwanese people were not really scared uh, or okay. intimidated. They were worried, but they're not intimidated, intimidated uh, by yeah. by the Chinese pressure. And so ever since then, um, uh, I think, um, I mean, media reports uh, have uh, done a, a lot about uh, showing uh, uh, Taiwanese public uh, the this constant um, harassment or um, coercion from China. So um, to the yeah. point that I think people in Taiwan are so used to it and, and not to mention the military side. I mean, you talked about economic coercion. And I think in Taiwan, we are more aware of that more sensitive to the economic coercion because it's um, part of our everyday lives, you know? So um, think about your, you know, the, the fruits that you're buying. Yes, you are not affected, but the um, 
the farmers uh, definitely are affected or people uh, doing business in China, you know, they may have to come back because they feel the invest investment climate in China is no longer safe or is no longer um, um, beneficial to, uh, to the Taiwanese investors. So, um, so um, different aspects of coercion, uh, I think uh, Taiwanese people are uh, aware and to the point that I'm used to. Let me um, cite a, a survey that um, I'm uh, I, on DSR. We've um, done um, regular survey polls of uh, Taiwanese public opinion regarding defense and military issues. So we've done this since 2021, and we do this like four times a year. So we've collected, I think, enough um, data on Taiwanese people's opinion. So. Uh, you know, interesting uh, questions that we ask. One question we ask uh, Taiwanese people is that, in their opinion, uh, do they think uh, um, war is going to happen in uh, five years? Then war refers to invasion from China. Yeah. And the majority of the respondents uh, said less likely. So they don't think uh, you know, war is likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And that corresponds to um my you know my 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 view and yeah. uh, my colleague's view but then we also ask uh, another question um which is about threat perception so we ask the respondents um how uh, what threat do they think is the uh, more serious one so we gave them a series of options we gave them um you know from china threat from china and uh, we, we also in, um, put in um, things like inflation, so economic uh, challenge or um, something like low birth rate, uh, which is um, something that you know, in Taiwan we are familiar with. So um, some social economic challenges, political challenges, along with the, um, the option threat um, from t um, China. Most people, most respondents pick China. So of all the options uh, that were there, uh, the threat from China was considered the top threat from uh, by the respondents. So I think that shows um, this uh, view that um, people in Taiwan are well well aware of this gray zone tactic. I mean, the the, the term gray zone tactic is it's they're not familiar with this, but they are familiar with this constant the harassment. Accent. Yeah, the yeah. acts uh, from China. Acts. Yeah, but uh, they yeah. don't think war is likely to happen. Yeah, seen, understood. Uh, in fact, let me put it, I, you know, if you remember, I sent you a video of whether China can invade. Uh, yeah. Let me tell you, let me, yeah, you know, we did a very good analysis because the person who did it with me was also a military man like me, and we've done a thing it was in hindi largely right but let me tell you i got a lot of reaction from china on that they kept track and i got a lot of uh, comments on my video channel that no we can do this all that but i heart of hearts i know they can't do it okay the third question which i have is what is kmt's game in you know what's this what's their skin in the game that they want to go towards china after, ah. you, know, you know, look, uh, let me put it, uh, you know, having read a lot about the KMT history, after at one point of time, ROC, KMT, and Nationalist Party, and all that, for a long time, you know, till uh, Chiang Kai-shek was uh, alive, his aim was to retake China and reestablish you know, the rule and throw out the PRC. But then that has gone. And for a long time, when the KMT was ruling, they their whole aim was to retake China. But have they given that up completely now? If they have or not, why are they going towards China? Is it to go back, take China into democracy or something? Or they have an agenda? Or just they want to become communists? I think uh, KMT has changed a lot. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay, I mean probably. back in history, it's it's the you know, Guo Gong right? You know the the civil war that that took place uh, in mainland China uh, between these two parties. I mean they were enemies. 
but now look at <laughs> how things have evolved. I mean, I, they, they are, you know, um, uh, work, trying to cooperate with each other. So uh, the nature of the relationship has definitely shifted, transformed a lot. And um, I'm not sure about, you know, if Ma Angel is considered a representative of the KMT uh, policy platform. I mean, his view, um, you know, is uh, pretty controversial. I think you know, for for a lot of Taiwanese, um, um, because I mean he personally thinks you can call him pro-China because um, I think he believes that there's no need to deter China. You now we talk okay. a lot about deterrence, you know, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in different ways. But mind you, personally uh, does not believe in deterrence. Um, his view is that um, you know we just too too small. China is huge, you know, so uh, no matter what we do, we can't uh, deter, we can't defeat, we can't deter, so why bother, you know, so, so the, the best way is not to deter, but to just have a dialogue, and I think uh, the, the, the tricky part is that uh, to him, you know, even if China is showing itself as a threat, you know, China is no longer hiding its intention um you know 92 consensus has shifted to just one china prc even that you know uh, my angel uh, still believes in dialogues uh with uh, china and i think that's why uh, xi jinping had a talk with him because i think to xi jinping my angel is the perfect candidate to have a dialogue with oh, but, yeah, okay. yeah yeah um but yeah. i don't know I, I I used to think that um, Mindjo's um, you know um, his stance on um, cross trade relations is kind of an outlier that he's a loner um, or outdated um, um, in the KMT. But given the recent developments inside KMT, I don't know. Maybe he is his view is becoming more mainstream. Uh, within the KMT, uh, uh, and uh, maybe they think that it's worthwhile to to share this view or to have this kind of view uh, because maybe they I, I don't know maybe uh, they they think that uh, by having that kind of view uh, they will be the one having access to to this dialogue negotiation with China because DPP okay. for you know. The CCP is not going to talk to, to to DPP. So DPP. Or even, maybe even thinking. Though, yeah, maybe. yeah. Okay, I get the point. Oh, next question I have is, look, uh, while everyone talks that China's first uh, priority, the highest priority is uh, you know reunification with Taiwan, peacefully or by force, they have a situation developing in Philippines. After all, every yeah. day there's some problem in Philippines. What is the sense of that problem in Taiwan? You know, around around the second Thomas Shoal and the Sabina Shoal, you know, there are every day water cannons being fired, bolts being banging each other, and uh, a lot of accusations against each other. A lot of backdoor negotiations have come out on the open. And uh, so, what is your sense of this whole story? Will will that end up in a war there? Because if it ends up in a war, Taiwan they can't come. Mm. That is something um, that's uh, there's going to be a lot of ten yeah, it's a lot of tensions happening um, in the Philippines, the South China Sea, and um, I I think while the United States is uh, doing a lot to uh, work work uh, with the Philippines. Uh, government and the Philippines yeah. government is uh, doing, you know, the the, the cooperation is there. So, uh, an attempt to defuse tension um, in in the South China Sea. Um, so, uh, uh, hopefully, that will not uh, escalate. Um, and okay. I, I, yeah. 